Okay, now that we've taken a look at U.S. assets, we need to spend some time understanding what an asset bubble is, how one might form, and the consequences of the aftermath. And we are specifically going to examine the housing bubble in detail because it's happening right now and is the largest bubble in all of history and will probably be the most destructive. Through the long sweep of history, the bursting of asset bubbles has nearly always been traumatic. Social, political, and economic upheavals have a bad habit of following asset bubbles, while wealth destruction is a guaranteed feature. Along the continuum of irrational financial behavior, it can be tricky to tell the difference between a bubble, a mania, and a mere touch of exuberance. A bubble is reserved for the height of folly, and history is rich with folly. Bubbles used to happen once every generation or so, because it took time to forget the pain from the damage. Today, we are facing the bursting of a second major asset bubble, housing, spaced less than 10 years from the bursting of the dot-com bubble. This is simply astounding and thoroughly unprecedented. So how would we know that we're in an asset bubble? What do they look like, and what can we expect when one bursts? The Fed famously likes to claim that you can't spot one until it bursts. But actually you can, and the definition is pretty simple. A bubble exists when asset price inflation rises beyond what incomes can sustain. A bubble represents people abandoning reason and prudence for hope and greed. Out of that prior list, let's look at one of the more interesting bubbles that happened in Holland in the 1600s. For some reason, the people of that time became infatuated with tulips, saw them as a surefire path to riches, and a financial mania set in. The bubble began when beautiful and unique variants in tulip coloration were developed and bulbs began trading at higher and higher amounts as the speculative frenzy built. At the height of the bubble, a single bulb of the most highly sought-after example, the Semper Augustus, seen here, commanded the same selling price as the finest house on the finest canal. But eventually, people figured out that you actually could grow quite a few tulip bulbs if you set your mind to it, and that perhaps bulbs were, after all, just bulbs. It is recorded that the tulip craze ended even more suddenly than it began, ending almost in a single day at the start of the new selling season in February of 1637. On that day, a silent whistle blew that only dogs and buyers could hear, and prices crashed. This example illustrates two characteristics of bubbles. First, that they are self-reinforcing on the way up, meaning that higher prices become the justification for higher prices. And second, that once the illusion is lifted, the game is suddenly and permanently over. A second example of a bubble comes from the 1700s and goes by the name the South Sea Bubble. The South Sea Company was an English company granted a monopoly to trade with South America under a treaty with Spain. The fact that the company was rather ordinary in its profits prior to the government monopoly did not deter people from speculating wildly about its potential future value, and the share price rose dramatically. Nor were people deterred by the fact that the company was billed as a company for carrying out an undertaking of great advantage, but nobody to know what it is. Sir Isaac Newton, when asked about the continually rising stock price of the South Sea Company, said that he could not calculate the madness of people. He may have invented calculus and described universal gravitation. But he also ended up losing over 20,000 pounds to the bursting bubble, proving that intelligence is no guarantee of avoiding being swept up in the animal instincts of a bubble. In 1720, the mania took off, displaying a textbook perfect example of an asset bubble. Here we see reflected two additional essential features of bubbles. First, they are roughly symmetrical in time, and second, they are symmetrical in price. That is, However long it took to create the bubble is roughly the amount of time it will take to unwind the bubble, and prices usually get fully retraced, if not a bit more. Here we can see those features in perfect form. Keep an eye on this shape. We'll be seeing it again and again. And here, in a chart of the Dow Jones beginning in 1921, we can see that the stock bubble that preceded the Great Depression followed the same rough trajectory, requiring about as much time to deflate as it did to inflate, and that prices roughly returned to the levels from which they started. And here's the stock price of GM in the blue line between the years 1912 and 1922, and Intel in the red line between 1992 and 2002, periods during which both stocks were swept up in bubbles. Here we might also note that the price data looks very similar for both stocks, despite the fact that they reflect a car company 
and a high-tech chip manufacturer separated by a span of 80 years. The fact that bubbles display the same price behaviors over the centuries tells us that they are not artifacts of particular financial systems, but rather are shaped by human emotions, and those have not changed through the years, and this is why you should hold on to your wallet any time you hear the words, this time it's different. Somewhere along the way, people started to believe this about houses, and it got to the point that people began to really believe that a house was a path to riches. And even better, it was a magical path that would transport you to Easy Street, even if you sat on your sofa the whole time drinking beer. Now, there's simply no way for this to be true, and we should have known better. Over the long haul, house prices will be set by whatever it costs to build a new house, meaning that inflation will dictate house prices. 